Thank you, Alan. We will go ahead and um, start with the introductions of the uh, team for Amity Foundation. Uh, my name is Joanne Sanchez. I am the project director for the third party administrator. Now, Rebecca. Everybody, I'm Rebecca Gray. I am the grant administrator for the third party administrator at Amity Foundation. Carmen. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carmen Jacinto, a uh, community-based projects uh, chief operating officer with Amity Foundation. Ellen. Thank you, Carmen. Alan Richards, Los Angeles Regional Administrator um, for Amity Foundation. And we'll move on over to Wendy. Thank you, Alan. Um, my name is Wendy Thompson, and I work for Amity as uh, the uh, Associate Director for uh, Third Party Administrator. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so Amity Foundation has been selected as the Third Party Administrator for the CFCI funding opportunities. And we wanted to create a space for the community to give feedback and recommendations on the eight different subject areas. Next slide, Carmen. Thank you. Uh, so we will begin with question number one. Uh, when you think about the program areas we're here to discuss today, what are the gaps in services that you know about in your community? And I'm gonna go over the eight uh, different subject areas that we're covering. Uh, the first one is career and education pathway programs, um, youth specific housing intervention, grants to justice focused community-based organizations, culturally affirming family reunification and pre-trial family support, Reentry programming for women, support services for returning LGBTQI plus residents, re-envision youth after school and summer programs, and youth centers. So again, when thinking about these uh, eight program areas uh, we're here to discuss today, what are the gaps in services that you know about in your community? Uh, please raise your hand and we will call an order of hands raised. Um, and you are also more than welcome to put um, your answers in the chat as well. Thank you. Tony? Yes, hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Bryan. I am the uh, founder and CEO for Mentors Inc. We are a community based nonprofit organization. Um, in South LA, and we do a lot of the things um, that are on this list. And I just want to say that I'm here to fill some of those gaps. And um, I can just go down the line. Career education pathway programs, as we know, um, it's a disproportionate amount of uh, students who were um, totally affected by the pandemic, uh, just in those numbers that I was looking at earlier. Um, you can see a disproportionate amount of um, our teens in our neighborhoods and underserved areas who did not even work or go to school during a pandemic, which was like 17% um, compared to the national average, which was like 12%. So um, I saw that right away and that just just struck me that we got to do something there. And I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I have a grant that we're putting together for um, which will directly um, tie back into the re-envision youth after summer um, programs. Because also, as we know, these programs have the longest waiting list. Uh, kids can't get in. Uh, kids have, uh, parents have trouble uh, with transportation, getting the kids to and from these programs. You know, parents have troubles, um, even balancing work and life just with these programs. And so we're trying to make it just as easy as possible um, at, that we can for, for these kids to uh, be able to take advantage and, and, and you know, have the resources. So I'm going to stop here because I can talk all day. Y'all know that. But okay, so somebody else try me. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Jean? Jean, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, I'm Jean Franklin, uh, representing Anchor of Hope International Ministries, Inc. And we're a coalition collaborative of faith-based and uh, houses of worship all around uh, providing uh, re-entry programs and ministry, uh, prison ministry uh, programs in the local churches and houses of worship. Uh, when I mean programming, I'm talking about mentoring, I'm talking about life skills, I'm talking about housing, I'm talking about employment ministries, and so forth. The gaps in the services uh, regarding the faith community uh, is that there is no coordination and identity of these uh, various uh, organizations and ministries that provide re-entry in prison ministries. And so to identify them, to coordinate, to network, to provide uh, information and training uh, because of the pandemic, um, the faith community now sees uh, the importance of providing these, these services such as housing and so forth. So there needs to be a coordinated networking, a collaborative a partnership uh, with Amity, with the county, with the city regarding that because every, uh, most people in the local churches and houses of worship have either been impacted themselves or have a loved one that has been impacted, but not only the churches themselves, but their surrounding communities. And so this, uh, there is a big gap in utilizing um, these particular networks. So I'm here because of Anchor of Hope and we did submit a project uh, idea um, on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Danielle Lafayette. I'm the founder and executive director of Unite A Nation. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in South Los Angeles, and we have housing, so we provide beds, and we also provide um, programs and services. One is called the HEAL program and also the POWER program, and we do youth development as well. And something that I noticed that is a gap, I'm a community resident from South, from South Los Angeles, born and raised, and a big gap within services is actually giving the um, funding to smaller community resident founded and led nonprofit organizations. Um, it's very difficult to build relationships with the larger, I guess, uh, lead agencies and things like that. And I do believe that there should be a better pathway for us to um, give services to our own community because we understand the needs of our community. So I do believe that that's a service gap that needs to be uh, rectified. Thank you. Hi everyone, Erica Torres with Haven Neighborhood Services. I wanna echo what was just said. Um, our nonprofit has been in, um, I founded the nonprofit 12 years ago, but it has been very difficult. We provide uh, credit counseling, foreclosure prevention, um, financial, top step financial literacy. And we started actually when the, when the foreclosure crisis happened in 2006, um, we moved on to helping um, going to halfway homes to provide top step financial literacy for um, previously incarcerated um, men and women. And we actually also have been at Lingwood Jail before the pandemic providing credit counseling, foreclosure prevention, financial literacy to the women incarcerated. So we think that we, um, it, it's just, it's been difficult, like Danielle said, as a small nonprofit, I, I know, believe it or not, 12 years in existence, but providing the services that we provide since 2011 and other bigger nonprofits that come in and they, because um, there's funding, they come in and they give them the funding, even though they don't run those programs. So um, thank you everyone. It is um, great to be here. Thank you, Erica. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am reading comments from the chat. So just a reminder, if you're unable to get through on the phone or you cannot raise your hand on Zoom, 
You can put your comments in the chat and I will read them aloud. We also have a Spanish language speaker if uh, your comments are in Spanish. Um, I have two, I have uh, three comments so far. Danielle articulated her comment. Jamie says, youth after school programs. That is where a gap is. In the Antelope Valley, there are very limited resources, but the need is great. And Jane Bond, uh, I see your hand is raised. Jane, I'm gonna let you speak to, to this. Thanks everyone. Hello um, everyone, Jane Bond from LARP Leaders, cohort number two. Um, I see some familiar faces. Uh, welcome to, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be in your space right now. So when I think about the program area that we're here, that, we, that is being discussed here today, the areas that I see, what I believe is not even represented. Um, I think it's the social determinants of, of, of the social the social economic class that you are represented by. <clears throat> it, could be, it could be any class. It could be the gay and lesbian, uh, social economic, it could be uh, re-entry. Re because, you know, I know that, I know that uh, some of you are familiar with my story, but having severe uh, sexual trauma at a young age causes disassociation, six and under. And I know that I have you know, throughout my travels, have uh, seen many, many uh, people in, in, in addiction, uh, in 12-step meetings, in, in rehabs, in, in the neighborhood themselves, where they are living this daily. You know, they, let's, say, let's just do the worst case scenario. They're living in the projects. They are being, their mom's in prison. Their dad is in rehab. Um, the uncle's taking care of him, and he's the one sexually abusing her. And then they walk through, they hear gunshots, we, we, they hear gunshots all night. And then they go to school where they have to pass through this gun detector. You know, that is stress and that is trauma. So none of this can exist unless somebody's mental health, their physical health. And I mean, look, if we just look at the, uh, I know I'm talking fast, I, a lot of traffic, but if we just look at the markets that surrounds the community of like, I'll just say Wilmington, because I'm in Peter right now. So, you know, the stores, they don't, you can't even find water inside the store. I mean, they have beer next to soda and the things that they it's a different store than if I went to Beverly Hills Fresh Fair you know if I went to a Fresh Fair Rouse they don't have the same they don't have the same access to good food or fresh food and it's a lot of sugary a lot of sugary I think I I think when I um when I went to that store they're literally one of the markers was starch you know so if they don't if we don't have if we're not dealing with our mental health that I know that the uh Recently, the Surgeon General, when he did his report on COVID, talked specifically about youth and being locked in COVID, locked in longer with if they were with their uh, abusers. You know, a lot of them were being abused, and that's 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 not a way a child could even begin to think about a career, education, housing. Like by the, by the time that they figure out that this is not cool and this is be happening to them, they're already a lot of them are addicted to drugs. And I think that if we normalize therapy. Um, and we normalize mental health, that conversation, these things would easily be able to be on the forefront, but and without dealing with the mental health, without dealing with physical health, our youth is not even thinking of this. This is, they're just trying to survive. And I think that, uh, you know, with disassociative disorder, I believe there's way more prevalent that they, than big pharma wants you to believe because the only thing that can help you is therapy. And if you talk about these things, your housing, your career, what do you want to do? Ask some follow-up questions to a child, they'll tell you. And so I, I feel the gap is the social determinants that are brought on by just who, how, what we're born into. And, and I think that needs to be represented. I think that's a huge gap. And that ties into all these things because a motivated child or a child who's, who's affirming their own existence will have more motivation. So thank you for letting me share. That's, that's where you. I live. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I, I don't even, I get, can I just sign out now? No, I'm just saying you guys have, <laughs> I'm still here. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thomas Lee, I'm CEO of First Place for Youth. Uh, we are based in Oakland, California, but we are the largest housing provider for transition age foster youth across the state. We serve 160 plus young people here in Southern California and Los Angeles County to be specific. And so our work is, of course, making sure that they have a fighting chance to live and provide for themselves and seek out their hopes and dreams after they leave foster care. With that said, 
One of the things that I think about is a huge gap is that funding for services for extended foster care here in Los Angeles County is one of the worst in the entire state. Uh, when you think about how competitive our economy is here, as well as the cost of living, it's a shame that the, the rates that the county pays for delivering these services to all providers is at one of the lowest, it's not even comparable to what's being paid in Alameda County, Solano County, in San Francisco County, Contra Costa County, many counties across the state. And so there is one major gap. And the reason why this is so important, if we're gonna think about how do we prevent young people from becoming a part of the, the larger adult homeless system, we have to think about how can we make sure that we can fix the problems with transition issues, specifically foster youth. It's a big problem. We have the largest child welfare system in the country here in Southern in Los Angeles County, but it's not a problem too big that we can't fix. And so we look at opportunities to scale. In fact, the Department of Children and Family Services has asked us to consider growing our numbers and serving more. But uh, I've been very disciplined in saying absolutely not until we can make sure that we cover some of these funding gaps. And so, of course, there are still a lot of young people struggling and it is through no fault of their own. So that's one really big one. And so we can definitely use more support to not only provide the services that they need that kind of encompass all of the different bulleted items here, but also working on the systems change work to make sure that we're getting our county officials and, and, and political powers to ante up. And so it's a two-part work. It's delivering really impactful services, but also making sure that we can uh, keep applying pressure on systems that uh, create, create unnecessary barriers for us to do what we do best. I think in second, then I'll stop here, just thinking about career and education programs. This of course is also equally essential. Uh, one of the things that I think we're all probably seeing is that uh, Los Angeles County is showing trends where it's going to be next to impossible for a young person to be able to live and thrive in Los Angeles County with rising rents and uh, limited options for employment, especially in employment pathways that lead to living wage jobs. And therein lies the big problem. Um, and so one of the things that we feel is like is incredibly important is making sure that we are continually building our in-house vocational and apprenticeship programs, but also leveraging the larger system programs and holding them accountable for creating easier pathways into getting access to better employment opportunities. Um, and as well as um, in growing and going to taking advantage of some of the post-secondary efforts. So there's a lot of different initiatives. They're very small in the piloted fashion. We need to grow those. One particular one that I wanna just highlight a lot of the community colleges, which a lot of youth go to, but unfortunately end up stuck there. A lot of, we have a very large community college system, but the average length of stay for a lot of young people is between six and seven years. And that's far too long to expect a young person to stay persistent in seeking out their educational goals, although some do. And so that becomes a, a sinkhole for a lot of people's hopes and dreams around post-secondary post -secondary education because they're stuck in an endless cycle of remediation as well as trying to manage a job on top of it. And so we've got to figure out a way to make these particular opportunities easier to access and also create some, some trails to be able to make their way out of that. And so those are the ones that I really wanted to, to highlight and I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for everybody else to, to jump in. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Eric? You said Derek? Yes, Derek. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, thank you, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, my name is Derek Spiva. I am the CEO of uh, CTV VR in the Antelope Valley. And um, um, I think I came to the last listening session that you all were at. And again, um, we, we, we run youth programs, um, youth career and education programs to be specific. Um, but the big issue here, especially in the Antelope Valley, and I'm sure it's probably the same across the county, having come from San Francisco and Oakland and Fresno and really seeing that they've really got quite a few more resources, or uh, I should say coordination. It's not perfect, it's, but it's a little bit better than what I've been experiencing here. But the issue really is being able to come up with, with one-stop shop comprehensive 
programs where parents and youth don't need to figure out how to navigate our crazy bureaucracy. Um, last summer, we had a summer arts program where we, we uh, uh, were able to hire 75 young people through the workforce system, which it has its own issues of non-accessibility. <laughs> uh, they said they wanted homeless, uh, homeless young people and we sent them some homeless young people and they were insisting on getting an address. That's, that's how kind of twisted that was. Um, but I think having, having agencies or programs where they're not designed to be silos but to support other uh, community-based organizations and being able to aggregate all of the information in one or two places so that young people don't get lost in the bureaucracy and can get the help they need from whoever handles it. And so being able to put together a network, a really tight, not just one and talk, but something where people actually work together to get something done is really, really important. And we can handle one of these areas or two of these areas or three areas, but until we deal with the whole person, um, we're gonna continue to flail and fail. So that's what we need, I think most of all is a cent is, is a number of centrally located youth center type areas that are well networked and one stop shops and can get can accommodate uh, various needs through other partnershiping organizations in one place. Thank you, Derek. Rebecca, I want to give you some time to read some comments. You're on mute, Rebecca. Thank you. I lowered my hand um, from Edward Smith in the chat. Glad to be heard, Bishop Ed Smith. As far as gaps go, more money needed to be provided for newer but effective community-based organizations to give them an opportunity to scale in order to have higher impact. Um, and Jean, uh, I, I see your comment here. I, I understand you have someone who wants to make a comment, but if can you, are you able to raise your hand again? Yes, yes, I did. I think I did. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Yeah, I raised my hand. Oh, great. Okay, so so we will call we will call on you in order, and and um, and Rudy can speak, um, and Danielle Lafayette also chiming in again. Programs for parents and families to develop together. More money for families with youth, and those are the comments from the chat. Thank you. Ronald? Uh, yes. Well, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Ronaldo Villeda. Uh, I'm the executive director of Hoops for Justice. Um, I, think, I think there's there's many different gaps, um, specifically when it comes to the juvenile justice system. Um, we need to focus on providing hope making Pony more accessible to grassroots organizations, um, specifically those that are led by uh, formerly incarcerated youth. We also need to create a continuity of care for those who are currently inside. We need, we need robust programs inside, period. We need educational, vocational, and career pathways for juveniles who are currently incarcerated. Um, we need more mental health access for youth who are also in facilities and in the community. Um, continuity of care is key when it comes to working with kids who are formerly incarcerated, who are foster youth, who are in the system. Um, I also believe that exploring partnerships with community colleges and universities to provide access to higher education. Um, that was something that helped me when I was incarcerated um, and is the reason why I have a degree today. Um, we also need to provide just more robust preventative, pro uh, preventative programming within our community, more sports programming. We need more creative outlets. We need more art. We need more things to entice youth to want to engage with organizations. Um, I know that the current organizations and the way that it stands, there isn't much in terms of uh, youth development, um, especially when it comes to re-entry work. Um, I think that's where we're falling short. Um, I feel like 
uh, the, the model that we've created with Peace Justice Reimagined can serve as a foundation to help organizations navigate um, how to create more robust programs. Um, and I also want to uplift, um, I want to uplift uh, the importance of uh, credible messengers. We need more credible messengers working with our youth, whether it's inside program, inside programming or in the community, because those are the people who are most impactful. Um, so we, we should definitely look into making funding more accessible. There's a lot of red tape when it comes to county funding. Um, a lot of these organizations cannot access it because they don't have the funds up front. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a difficult, uh, uh, again, the bureaucracy, someone already mentioned it. Bureaucracy is difficult for um, organizations to navigate at the county level, um, but also for parents and for youth. Um, we need to also focus on more family therapy, family reunification. Um, that was a big one for me when I was incarcerated. Um, and lastly, I also want to uplift, we, we need to, um, sorry, I, I, I don't know, I'm so sorry. We need to, um, we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to give community-based organizations access to the funding to create the infrastructure that we, that to, create, to create the infrastructure that is inside programming, continuity, care, and preventative. We want it to be full circle. Um, when it comes to housing, housing is very hard for you to get. There isn't very much housing for you coming home who are formerly incarcerated, um, especially those coming in from DJJ. Um, all across the board, I feel that uh, grassroots organizations uh, need to be completely more access to funding. Um, yeah, and, and I really, 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 really believe that the educational career pathways are lacking. We don't have anything of substance. We don't have anything that truly captures um, um, how to take youth who are involved in the system, whether it's foster youth system and foster, or those who are incarcerated, to be able to have access to the resources to navigate those systems. Um, and I, I, I think that's really important when we're talking about youth and talking about sustainability. Um, and just overall sports programming, we need more art therapy, we need music, we need things that youth are going to actually want to do um, and just create those mechanisms so that it's accessible for everybody to um, have their resources available and to make it easier for them to navigate the systems. Thank you, Ronaldo. Jane? Uh, yes. Okay, Rudy. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hi, my name is Rudy Nunez, and I am blind. And so, and um, there's see, there's no um, um, organizations for disabled or uh, well, for me, for blind, and it's hard for me to get um help. Um, some sometimes I need uh, uh legal papers, legal papers to be filled out. Um, and I don't have anybody that can help me in those particular offices. Um, so, um, I, um, help me, Jane. <laughs> so, what were you telling me about how you you're on you're on? Um, he he doesn't have any of the uh, the equipment, right? Oh yeah, my bl blind equipment. There's no access to that, even though he has no money. He'll be on the bus, and uh, no one will help him get on the bus. They'll just push him through. Um, he has been blind since he was 10. He had glaucoma. Yes. And so he's very high functioning, but I know that he, there, there's a lot, uh, when I hear him talking, he said that he can't, he couldn't access services for housing. No. For funding because he couldn't get anybody to fill out paperwork. I said, so what about Braille? And I mean, what about those agencies? Um, the, the, well, they, they only focus on the things that, within the Braille Institute of uh, uh, things, but not like that. I, I'll try to help. Yeah, I don't get any help. So I think what he he tried he was listening to. So what he's thinking is like there's nothing for disabled here. There's also nothing for it, 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 people in his situation, blind, disabled, nothing like that. There are people who can't hear, uh, mobility issues, and I think that that's a disservice because I know that um, being blind, uh, being or, uh, yeah, being blind. Or no, just blind, being blind. So not so being blind. It could be a scary situation in general, and to know that he 
he can have opportunities, but yet nobody will have him fill out the paperwork. Those services, that's a huge gap. It's a huge gap for him. And, and you know, he's all practically crying. I said, well, I can help you because, you know, and he's just like, oh, no, 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 you're, you say that. And I'm like, calm down, you know. So I think those services are different. And I know that he, he's been, so I said, here, it's your time to speak, Rudy. Oh, I got tongue tied. Sorry. <laughs> so that's what he wanted to say. So uh, is that, are we good with that? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Anything else? I was, you know, uh, if it wouldn't have been for Jane, Jane, Jane no. it's, okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's oh, okay. Oh, I, I just got to thank you, but I wish <laughs> you guys could have uh, more services, you know, departments for uh, blind people, or like for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Noel? Oh. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Emily, thank you so much uh, for providing the space for uh, um, other CBOs to talk. Um, you know, one of the things here, um, I am, uh, my name is Noel Lopez. I'm the Deputy Director at Haven Neighbor Services. Um, we are the leading uh, financial capability agency here in Los Angeles. Um, one of our bread and butters here in LA that we offer here to uh, LMI uh, individuals, especially reentry and transitional age youth is, um, uh, financial coaching around credit counseling, debt reduction, uh, identity debt assistance, any type of financial crisis that the uh, participant is dealing with, you want to come to, uh, to uh, Haven Neighbor Services to receive uh, financial counseling services. Um, of course, because of the pandemic, we've seen an increase, uh, a 57% increase in terms of our financial co um, um, coaching services, especially around debt reduction and uh, credit counseling. Um, a lot of our community members, especially the reentry and the transitional aid, uh, tr transitional age youth uh, population, a lot of them are either credit in, uh, credit visible or or have a mismanaged uh, credit. A lot of them are experiencing a lot of delinquency in their debt because of the pandemic. As a lot of you are aware here in LA, that um, when when the city launched the uh, the Angelino card, we had over 350,000 residents here applying for financial assistance. We also had a lot of our Angelinos applying for universal basic income through the city of LA with the big leap and the county in terms of the Breathe LA County. Um, a lot of individuals, uh, LMI, that are in desperate need for um, universal base of income. What I think a lot of our CBOs, I think, would agree with us, uh, agree with me in this opinion, that there is such a dire need for financial assistance. If we had the, the capacity to take over um, a, a big pool of money so that we could allocate those funds back to the community to help them with their debts, to help them with their credit, to help them overall financially sustain themselves. I think that's the biggest need right now here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Noelle. Rebecca? I'm reading comments from the chat from Gerline Ahuja. I want to uplift Youth Justice Reimagined, Youth Justice Coalition, and Visionary Youth Los Angeles, and Inside Out Writers. Great work. Uh, Oya Sherills um, had her hand raised here for a while, but has had to step away. Her baby is fussy, so she will share in the chat. I believe there is a gap in healing services for those who identify as survivors of crime creating healing services, especially for youth who have experienced harm, but in general, creating spaces for healing that can lead to a culture that centers culturally relevant healing. This is incredibly necessary. A lot of the times the people that I work with that have found themselves to be part of the reentry population talk about how first when they came, they were survivors of crime. It is a cycle of violence that can be stopped if Resources are filtered to address the unaddressed trauma in the lives of the most harmed and least helped. In other words, the youth, men of color, low income folks, but we must be innovative in how we make these changes. Thank you for creating this space that we can voice what is possible together. Uh, Janine writes in the chat, Paving the Way Foundation in Lancaster offers vocational training pathways for those that are justice impacted we continue to find ourselves with more need for training and jobs, but the funding is very limited to support. 
Uh, Jean Franklin writes in the chat, have you spoken with Department of Rehabilitation? Danielle Lafayette, maybe a response to that says yes. Uh, and the final, the final comment here, um, oh no, one more from Jean. Uh, Pastor Mescelia says, we need funding, livable wages for those who work with reentry population, at-risk youth, family reunification, gang intervention, prevention services. We need capacity building funding to hire qualified individuals, along with safe spaces open on weekends where children and youth can be provided services and their families. When they are available as opposed, okay, when they are available, when children and families are available as opposed to when providers are available. Um, Jane Bond, uh, wanted to let everyone know that, that Rudy states that the services um, that they can access are very limited. Uh, oh, Danielle Lafayette was agreeing with providing dollars directly to community residents and community resident lead organizations, agreeing with the speaker. Um, and Jane Bond is clarifying, Rudy states services for non-sighted individuals are very limited. So, oh through the Department of Rehab, but through the Department of, through LA County Department of Rehabilitation, services for uh, non-sighted individuals are very limited. Thank you, Rebecca. Any more um, comments on question number one before we move? On to the next one, Cortez. Uh, I'm sitting here in our uh, resource center, and what we're actually doing is uh, doing artwork with the youth. So I just asked them. I was I was sitting there listening, and I was asking about what do you guys need, and a few of the kids here want to express that. So they were eager to open up and share what they need, you know. And I'm gonna let them talk. Hi, so I feel like we need um, like trained actual caring psychologists um, on site at, on high school and middle school campuses, elementary school too. Um, yeah, counselors that actually care and are not just there for the money. That's what I think. Uh, I think we need more accessible like needs like food, drinks, clothes, shoes for kids or people in general who can't access it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Now, we have a program right here, and it's called the Art Squad. They're doing a, a mural, they're doing everything possible to help the community understand the gang violence and everything else that's going on in our in our communities. But a lot of times, people always don't ask the source. I'm the type of person I want to ask the source and find out what's needed through their eyes, not just through us because we're adults and we see they need money, they need this. We all know what everybody needs, but nobody has actually opened up and ask the youth what they need, you know? So that's one of the things that I want to touch on, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Cortez. Okay, uh, we are going to move on to question number two. Thank you, Carmen. Given the category we are discussing and the services we have been talking about, what changes in your community would mean that the services have been successful? What kind of changes do you need to see in your community to mean that services have been successful? Go ahead. Pastor Michelle, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, yes. The first thing I think that would make sure that our uh, that the programs were working with deliverables is that uh, there would be a lesser crime. Uh, number one, uh, we all probably know that. 
there would be lesser crime and then there would be lesser, uh, then the children would be able to most definitely move around a little bit freer. In our communities, we have children that are, some are afraid to go to school. Uh, so we do need more safe passage, but I think to see change, uh, what change would look like in our community, we're just, we just would have safer spaces for uh, our children, our elders to move around freely in community. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Jean? Um, the same as, uh, I wanna add to what the pastor just said, but um, the changes that I will know uh, with the programming uh, as far as being successful is that people will, particularly in um, the so-called faith communities, will, will be welcoming, will be helpful, will be trained, uh, because as one, someone indicated that it would be great to have psychologists at, at some of the, the schools. Um, and by having coordinated uh, programming and connectivity and collaboration and partnership and referring uh, coming out of the faith community uh, would be essential. And I would think that uh, they would realize because of the different churches uh, and houses of worship having effective programming in their churches uh, off hours and doing day, daylight hours would be beneficial and everyone has the ability to serve uh, within their um, genre, within their day work, you know, and so they don't see where they can fit in because uh, the programming within those churches and houses of worship have not been marketed uh, to the point that everyone can see that they can serve, they can, they can be of help, not only at, at the programming at their churches and houses of worship, but also within the various communities and developing partnerships with the local houses of worship. And I'm sure at the schools, there would have to be, you know, background clearance and all of that. That's what also the network of churches, part of their programming and supportive services would entail in making sure that the people who are, are providing the services at the churches are qualified. They have gone through background checks and so forth um, if needed. If needed, what I mean by background checks, if, uh, you know, a formerly incarcerated individual wants, you know, who, who wants to go inside the, the schools, that might be a, a, a barrier. But for those who are not, but they want to serve in the capacity of re-entry and whatever they can, um, you know, they will be able to pass those particular background checks. Um, but I would think that there would be uh, success being, being shown with a tighter uh, network of faith communities and churches um, who are already being trained, who already have these programs and services intact already, but just need to be identified, coordinated, and, and uh, provide the networking and the referrals, uh, and then identify them as well. So that's what I see. Thank, Thank you, you, Jean. Derek? Um, I'm a big believer in outcomes um, and data-driven programming. Um, we can throw, you can throw all the money at something as you, that, that you want to, and that's not gonna change anything by itself. Um, I've been in situations where there were large organizations that gobble up all the money and there were absolutely no changes. And if you talk to any of the youth that were involved, there was nothing that was success, nothing that you could point to that was successful. It's very difficult, especially if you want to make sure that the actual funding gets to grassroots programs. It is a difficult task to measure effectiveness. But in this digital age that we live in, there are we have way more tools than we did 20 or 30 years ago to do this and do this in real time. 
Um, so I think I think the way that you can look that you can count on success or that you can see success is making sure that there are uh, uh, tools and mechanisms for which you can either do surveys, you know, um, um, monkey surveys, probably one of the, the best inventions since sliced bread for folks who are running programs and just wanna really make sure that you're, you're, you're hitting your target areas and the change is actually taking place. Um, it may, you may even wanna consider a third party that that's all they do is evaluate the programs. Um, um, that could be good, can be bad. I've seen some of those situations where it, it was a politically driven situation. And then there's others where they really genuinely took the time to find out what was working and what was not working. And especially if you want to make sure the grassroots organizations are equally funded, there needs to be a mechanism for measuring success. And it's not always numbers. Sometimes it's a successful project. Sometimes it's journaling that takes place and measurement that's determined by observation by those who are trained to observe what has been successful and what's not. Also the going to the wider community who actually should see a, a drop in crime, should see fewer young people going getting incarcerated, to, could see more um, uh, released uh, incarcerated people being able to find jobs and get settled into the community and that kind of thing. There are a variety of ways of doing that for folks who really know how to collect data properly. And so I think some of the money needs to be invested in successful, accurate outcomes measurement. Thank you, Derek. Jane? Um, yes. So for me, for, I'm sorry. Um, for me, um, for what I what I was speaking of um, as a social determinants, right? So as I've you know been saying, uh, cats, cat, uh, a cats assessment, a compulsory assessment for therapeutic services, where since it's um, medical, it would be protected by HIPAA. So when you're just asking a follow up bunch of questions like, do you sleep well at night? Do you what you hear? Is your area noisy? Just things that would let you know that maybe this this child is, has a little might be would like to talk about some of the traumas that they might be experiencing in a safe environment. Um, that I, I I've been collab I've been uh, collaborating with many people and I actually have a prototype for that. But in order to get that done, that's a clinical thing. So that would you would need more clinical based peer reviewed studies that would would provide very real solutions and recommendations. Per the Surgeon General's request, when he put out his uh, report on the COVID, he requested these things. Give, give us some ideas of how we can better serve the community. And, and, and it's very specific. If you haven't read it, read it it's very interesting. It's very well, like uh, easy to read. And he did give a lot of the COVID depression symptoms of not only adults, but he was really focusing on children. And so I hear a lot about trained staff. So that's for my, for what I think I would know that that would be that is being successful is that somebody or would implement or myself or somebody help me implement assessment so that we can get to more youth and more children and they have a voice they don't have a voice and that sucks because i know when i didn't have a voice maybe if i would have had somebody would ask the follow-up question and i'm not just because of the error of the time um things i maybe i wouldn't end up on skid row you know uh in so many rehabs arrested 47 times 47 misdemeanors by felonies, like maybe that's something I would, wouldn't have had experience, but then I wouldn't be here. So, you know, everybody has a path, but not everybody needs to go that path. So some can do it and some can't, and that's, and, that, and that's where we lose the children, you know? Another thing is I hear a lot about trained staff. Um, thinking about it, there's only 10% of psychologists, MFTs or MFTIs that are minority. The community that these, the the, tra the trained staff would serve would be 90% minority. So you have more, um, uh, you know, the, the minorities who are actually in the field don't match the minorities in which they'll be serving. So how is someone, and this, I know that this is like maybe an archaic way to think, but I still believe when you're sitting across from somebody who has lived experience and they're trying to tell you how to get, get, get your life back, you listen, as opposed to somebody who had some school experience in, and you guys, I mean, that has nothing to do with them as a person, but 
you know, it's a difference when you're sitting across from somebody and they have no of your, none of your experiences because they didn't live in a, a, a in a marginalized um, environment or um, you know uh, economic class. They had great uh, options for food. They had good went to great schools. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Lock and Alder Flint Ridge. It's right there by um, Cal, um, NASA. That school, that high school, has a pool, has a tennis court, a huge a football stadium. I mean. It's a very affluent community right up the street. And let's say uh, Sereno, Al Sereno, they don't have those, those same, they have, there's no guns, um, you know, um, uh, you know, gun to tell you if there, somebody's got a gun uh, in that school, very open, it's right by NASA, just right up the street, Al Sereno. You can't get into school if you're wearing baggy pants. So I'm not sure where that imbalance lied, where that imbalance came from, but it is there. And and, and we talk about it in our in policies. We just talked about that a lot of that stuff today. So that's an imbalance. And I think knowing when I see those balances start to even out, then I all know there's some success. And so thank you for letting me share. Judy, is there anything you want to say? <laughs> Joseph? Yeah, Joseph, Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Quintana. I represent United American Indian Development, the largest human health service provider for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in Los Angeles and Orange County. I think for us to see uh, long-term success, I think we need to overcome a lot of the misconceptions we have about Native Americans. I think for our young people, it's extremely debilitating. We have significantly high rates of suicide ideation. 40% of American Indian women have had thoughts of committing suicide by 25 years old. So there's a tremendous amount of hopelessness. Uh, also tremendous gaps in educational achievement, um, high rates of unemployment, as opposed to all other racial ethnic groups, over 2% higher rates of unemployment. Um, so continued cycles of poverty are also another issue. I know there was mention of social determinants of health, but how can we also make sure that we have pathways to upward mobility for our young people uh, so that they know that they're a part of the fabric, which is LA County. And oftentimes I think something that is also uh, significantly difficult for our young people is the misconceptions of young people. They buy into the stereotypes that Angelinos can't see themselves as being American Indian. Yet, the America, yet uh, Los Angeles has one of the largest and most diverse populations of American Indians or Alaska Natives for any large metropolitan city or county in the entire nation. And so I think those are some of the things that we can seek to address and make sure that uh, we can, of course, change for our people. Of course, for all people, we deal, we're deal we dealing with housing issues, um, high rental or high rental costs, severely rent burden, uh, making sure that housing ownership isn't just a dream, but actually, actually a reality for all of our people. And, uh, and so those are some things I, I think that we can overcome together going forward. Thank you, Joseph. Rebecca, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to read comments from the chat. These are in response to uh, question one, in response to gaps. Um, from Reginald Loudermill, president of IWATC, says, we are teamed with two other nonprofit organizations in which we go into juvenile camps and interact with the youth through a unique virtual reality headset to introduce them to the many facets that life may bring them. But lack of funding is really hampering us. And Diana Medell with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Carson says, we need safe spaces for young people outside of their school, community hubs with centralized resources. And Alita Ledesma says, Arts for Healing and Justice Network. Uh, oh, is Alita Ledesma represents Arts for Healing and Justice Network and would like to uplift the role of the arts as part of uh, question one, part of GAPS. Those are the comments from the chat. Thank you, Rebecca. Danielle? Yes. Hi, Danielle. I'm the executive director. I, um, sorry, my soccer practice. Um, so I, mine was to, to, the, to the question is um, how I would know the programs are successful is if we 
um, have, if we reverse, so basically it says that Black people will have a zero um, net worth um, in year, I think 2028, I can't remember the exact year, but basically our net worth will be zero. And we, sh we to know that the programs are successful, we would reverse that and make sure that we actually have um, generational wealth within our communities. We would also, so right now we need to change the um, education and wealth gap for black people, low income people and people from, I'm just gonna talk about South LA, but people in general who are in our communities that have low, um, lower incomes, we need to make sure that we decrease the um, education and wealth gap for people in our communities. And one of the ways by doing that, as I mentioned before, is making sure that we fund people from our communities because that's also giving jobs, that's giving businesses, and that's giving services to our community at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Patricia? Second. Okay. Um, the question uh, which states that um, the services what services should we receive to make sure it's have been successful? That's in my own words. And um, I think that um, we need a very holistic community, um, meaning that accessible to quality education, if that service is changed and everybody receive the same amount of quali uh, quality education, uh, we need safe streets from crime, uh, um, enforcement, and, and also the community should come together and uh, make sure that the, the streets are safe. Uh, we need safe homes. We need uh, adequate employment. We need um, safe transportation. Our kids can't walk to school. Uh, without dodging from cars. And um, so we need safe transportation. We need wellness programs. And in South LA, we need healthy restaurants. We need um, quality grocery stores, like some Trader Joe's that will provide this wellness for us. We need uh, generational bridging. And what I mean by that is that we need to bridge the youth with us seniors and that they can see the quality and the wisdom that we can give them. And we can also receive um, quality uh, tech support from them or how life has changed for them, but bridging our generation together. We need environmental justice. We gotta make sure that um, our environment is safe and uh, toxins are reduced in our environment. And, um, uh, with quite a few more changes. If we uh, get those changes and um, along with the lights that are in our community, the light of the school, the light of the church and the light of the homes, if we can get all those things changed, then we'll see a lot of light in our community and um, it will be very holistic and very safe and our services will that you give will provide a happier home. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, anyone else before we move on to the next question? Okay, next slide, please. We are seeking assistance in reaching as many organizations as possible. Do you have any suggestions about email lists, convenings, coalitions, or other places where we might be able to reach service providers? Again, so we wanna, we wanna reach as many people as possible. Please raise your hand uh, to give any suggestions about um, other organizations that we can reach out to, or you can also just put that in the chat. Jane. So I think that we're seeking. Okay. So I think that if you act, if you uh, ask or access more um, policy entrepreneurs, you know, where the, where their whole job is to is to create these email lists or, or or a way for to reach more service providers, 
put that through the uh, policy entrepreneurs that seem to be out there that want something to do and and they know how to do it. I mean, that's a lobbying situation. Wouldn't that be something like more like lobbying, right? I mean, because just you, I know you guys are great, Amity. I mean, we've known each other for years, but you, you guys got a lot going on. And, and then I guess there was, I know that the last meeting we had, they were on you guys about like it being too, um, that you didn't go through, you know, it's too, um, what do they call that? Monopolized or whatever. And that was, you know, I spoke, I'm like, that is not true. But I think that that would be a job for somebody like that who has whose specific job is to do that. And I think that'd be helpful. Thank you. Alida. Hello, everyone. Um, I think um, one coalition that is coming to mind for me is the Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition, also known as Layup. Um, they are comprised of a different both advocacy and service providers, really working at the intersection of juvenile justice, um, reentry support, restorative justice. Um, so I think they would be a, a really wonderful coalition to tap into in terms of getting the word out to um, community and grassroots organizations. Um, we're also a network, so Arts for Healing and Justice Network is comprised of currently 15 community-based art organizations. Um, and so we're also happy to disseminate any information to our partners, um, emerging partners, um, or anybody who might be um, eligible to, to apply or qualify for um, these sources of funding. Thank you. Thank you. Derek? Um, I think this is a serious problem. I know here in the Antelope Valley, it is very, very serious in the fact that there, it, again, there doesn't seem to be any comprehensive list of um, organizations and individuals and resources. And um, the, doing this haphazard is going to continue the haphazardness. Um, again, some of the money needs to be allocated to someone who's going to be responsible for the marketing and making sure that the information gets out to where it's it belongs. Um, because social media has moved on us so fast and people don't even look at websites anymore and Facebook's in and it's out and Instagram is in and then it's out. There need, this is a specialized area that you can't do as an afterthought. And if you really want the programs and services to be known by the people who really need them. Someone has to focus on this as an intentional task. So that means that, um, um, and I know with us, with our charter schools uh, synergy, we were looking for lists and things like that. There weren't any. So we had to build from scratch. And luckily we had a really good marketing department and they really got out there and, and, and you know, looked under the bushes and found people and kids and all of that. And I think this is going to need to be constructed from the ground up because to my knowledge, and uh, I've been in Northern California until about three years ago, but even growing up here in Southern California, there's never been a good network of, of a communication network. And so someone needs to focus on communicating these services to the folks that need them. Um, luckily now people do have phones and things like that, but they're not all on the same services. So someone has got to drive that. It needs to be carefully planned, calculated, strategic. And, and again, you got to realize that there are homeless folks with no homes. So you can't uh, uh, assume everybody has a computer. Um, th there are folks who are not stable and they're going from place to place to place to place, you can't count on them hearing about these services haphazardly. It has to be intentional, it has to be comprehensive, and it has to be strategic. Thank you. Jean? Uh, did you call Jean? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, again, coalitions uh, is what we do as far as Anchor Cope is concerned, uh, have been in existence since 2014. Before that, uh, Anchor of Hope um, uh, 
started another organization called United Job Creation Council, UJCC, which is a coalition of collaborative of faith communities, community-based organization all around local hire and construction uh, uh, industry um, programming, uh, pre-apprenticeships. So with the coalition of Anchor of Hope, uh, which is a network of churches and faith-based organizations, uh, and we are strategic, we are intentional uh, about what we do, and the coalition is made up of large churches, uh, small and medium-sized ones, not only in um, South Los Angeles, but Long Beach and also the Valley. And uh, these coalitions share uh, information, provide training, uh, provide resources, but mainly training uh, so that uh, these coalition part of our networks are at capacity to be able to provide uh, specific services and that it is evidence-based, uh, but also utilizing the churches and the faith community. That is a strong network within themselves, individual churches, getting the word out within uh, their congregants and uh, their area communities. And so uh, this is uh, essential and, and to utilize the coalition of faith churches, not uh, some community-based organizations are listed as faith-based, they're not, but they use that category. I'm talking about when I'm, I'm pulling out specifics churches, houses of worship, uh, uh, where these programs are not indoctrinating anybody to their beliefs, but specific programs that they provide and, and they uh, have, have a, a passion for as it relates to re-entry and as it relates to um, prison ministry. Uh, mental health is, is a focus as well. Mentoring is a focus, as I mentioned before. And of course, job readiness, job placement, job referrals, uh, uh, legal services, it's free legal clinics in these churches as well. So utilizing the coalitions, particularly like Anchor of Hope uh, is, is essential. And I would uh, highly recommend that. Um, the email list, is, is also important because the email list of churches and faith organizations that provide services is, um, is really, really uh, outdated. And so um, that needs to be updated. That needs to be an outreach about identifying who they are and what programs and services that they provide at their local churches and, and houses of worship and non-denominational. When I mean churches, I'm talking about non-denominational. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Pastor Michelle? Uh, yes, yes, Joanne. I just wanted to say um, Anchor of Hope has been very, very strategic in uh, making sure that a lot of uh, us here in community get uh, that information. And I wanna just say thank you personally, Ms. Franklin, while I have the time. Um, but also want to say that there's an organization community uh, coalition, the LA Violence Intervention Coalition, um, uh, let's see, uh, the Prevention Network. There's a lot of organizations at the time right now that are reaching out in community, building a strong coalition. So I just want to give you a couple of names and I'll put them in the chat um, so that if you are building that outreach and engagement team, you'll have access to that information. But then I also wanna know like, so how, how, also how far are you guys reaching? Is this a spa six, spa six, seven, eight? Like what's the reach or is it LA County? What, what's, what's the actual reach? This is LA County. Okay, so all of LA County? Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Rebecca? Hi all, I'm reading comments from the chat. We have two comments that address question one, gaps. From Joseph Quintana, 
We also need access to quality food for our young people and for them to know how to prepare those foods. We can overcome youth obesity and diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And yes, we need our young people to also have access to high skilled jobs or to see themselves reflected in political office or leadership roles. Um, and also addressing gaps, Jane Bond commented that non-sighted individuals have no consistency, even in crossing the street with audio crosswalks. Addressing question three, uh, networks, Oya Sherills offers in the chat, Californians for Safety and Justice, uh, also known as CSSJ, is comprised of over 11,000 members across California and also mentions SLAHC, the South LA Healing Circle Collective, comprised of folks doing healing work who are representative of the communities they serve. And Jane Bond wants Amity to know that Jane is available for hire to handle question three. Thank you, Rebecca. Derek? I'm sorry, there's one thing I forgot that I think is imp important enough that warrants uh, me speaking again. I apologize for that. Um, I think, it's really important. And I, I, now I've been, I've been a pastor and I love churches and Christians and so on and so forth. But I also believe that one of the reasons why we need to kind of start something but from scratch in terms of a communication network is that we need to reach beyond that. Um, I know that for LGBTQ uh, folks, for whatever reason, um, churches may not be, feel like or be, they may perceive churches as not being friendly places. Um, that's nothing to say about the churches or whatever. There's a lot of things that happen. That's a very complicated thing. I don't want to unpack that, but I'm just saying that the reach needs to be beyond that. It needs to include synagogues and mosques. And you need, and the question always needs to be asked too, that if my children are Muslim or if my children are Hindu or if my children are Jewish, do I feel comfortable with them going to a, a, a Christian house of faith to receive services? The answer may be it's okay, but the answer may not be that. And we can't just assume everybody feels comfortable everywhere. So it's really important that whoever puts this, this list together or does this communication that they're able to reach beyond the traditional walls that we've used in the past because we failed in the past, mainly because we're not reaching all the folks that have the need of the services. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Derek. Jean? Yes, I, I appreciate um, the previous comment very much. And she's totally right. That's why I specifically said houses of worship, non-denominational um, and uh, Part of our coalition is to um, train and work with uh, those uh, houses of worship churches that uh, take in everybody that serves everyone. Uh, so it's not it, it, it's not uh, uh, eliminating anyone. So that's our coalition. Those are the the churches, the houses of worship whether you're Buddhist, um, whether you are uh, Hare Krishna, whether, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. You are, you come together as a community to worship whatever God or you, you choose to worship um, or not worship. So that's part of uh, what we do and part of our coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Patricia? I agree with Jean. I'm a pastor, uh, Mount Salem Church. Um, and we do not look at any individual. We do not label any individual. We look for a heart, a heart to help anyone. And um, so, we have no problem with whatever you call a problem. 
that's not a problem to us. We look for a heart. We look for an individual and we service individuals. So that's where I come from as a pastor. It's the heart that we look for and the changes that we need uh, in regards to what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Rebecca? I'm going to read some suggestions from the chat, uh, addressing question three from Megumi, Washington. The Veteran Peer Access Network, VPAN, from Pastor Michelia, Community Coalition Prevention Network, Los Angeles Violence Intervention Coalition, Urban Peace Institute, Community Build, Stop the Violence Prevention Coalition. Thank you for those. Um, Megumi Washington, also MHA, Mental Health. I'm, I'm not sure what MHA um, is short for. So if you want to expand upon that. It's Mental um, Health America. Oh, Mental Health America. Thank you. Uh, and also offers a um, an email in the chat uh, and I to to contact for more for more ideas. Um, sorry, I've lost my place just a little bit. Here we have okay uh, from Sarah Manny Mathalu, the LA Opportunity Youth Collaborative. The OYC's mission is building multi-sector partnerships to improve education and employment outcomes for transition age foster youth to thrive. Today, the OYC is a collaboration of 70 partners that includes public agencies, community-based organizations, educational institutions, philanthropic foundations, youth and public and private employers working in concert to ensure that every youth is served in a holistic way with a coherent array of complementary services. Fundamentally, the OYC's collaborative prioritizes the voices of youth partners in our community, and young people are engaged in decision-making by initiating action within the collaborative and advocating on behalf of their peers. Oya Shirelles um, says, uh, wanted to add that CSSJ has an LA chapter that just recently sent 600 survivors of crime to the state capitol to advocate together and to heal together. So this is a local, so this is local and there's a network of hundreds of grassroots organizations and providers. I wanted to note about CSSJ. Um, Megumi Washington adds the continuum of care, COC boards and Janie uh, adds L-A-R-R-P, Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership. Um, those are suggestions from the chat. I'm gonna take this moment to let everyone know that these questions are available to you on an online form. So if for any reason you haven't been able to participate today or you know someone who has input that we should hear, you can give them a link to our online form. Uh, and uh, we can take input that way. I'll be putting that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. I don't see any other hands up, so I will be moving on to question number four, which is our last question. And question number four is, do you have any recommendations regarding how we might ensure equity throughout the funding application process and after the funding awards are made. And please raise your hand. We will call you in the order that your hands are raised. Derek? Forgive me, I'm trying not to talk too much. <laughs> but uh, um, I think what's unique about the program that you all are offering is the fact that you even care about equity among organizations and making sure that smaller organizations are treated fairly. And I think um, the elephant usually, the elephant in the room usually for this, this type of funding 
is um, some sort of mechanisms for making sure that funding is ha handled in a, 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 um, a responsible way and that folks can be held accountable for making sure that um, funding goes to where it's intended to go. And again, I think we have, I've been in this 40 years. Back in the day, we were just kind of went on people's word and hoped that, you know, hoped and prayed that they didn't go out and buy new cars and um, <laughs> new houses and boats and such. And I know that's really the fear because this is tax money that um, you're responsible for making sure it goes to what it's intended to. And again, I want to say that there are digital tools, many digital tools that can be utilized to ensure the accountability of funds so that there is, that removes the excuse for not including small grassroots organizations from benefiting because with a, a large bureaucratic organization usually does not have the passion to go out and really meet people on the streets and do what's necessary. I was in San Francisco last week and it was really interesting to see how, you know, the city's trying to get folks off the street and this and that. And again, bureaucracy really tries, but is never going to have the same kind of power and influence as grassroots, down to earth, small equity organizations. Using the appropriate digital tools can accomplish two things. One, make sure that you, you can take some risks with uh, smaller organizations, but making sure that the accountability piece is in place and making sure that the outcomes and the measurements and all of that are fair, equitable, and achievable and measurable. Thank you, Derek. Megumi, Washington. Hey guys, uh, thanks for uh, hearing me out in this one. Um, I really think uh, being that we have a, our organization is Yishida Yamada in Washington, Services, but we also recently um, uh, uh, over the running of a wonderful nonprofit that's been in existence for a very long time. It is the Women in Transition uh, 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 a Reentry Project. Um, and I've seen, because we have a kind of a mixed uh, 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 organizational structure, we have an LLC and a, a nonprofit that are mixed, I've seen that. Um, just like one of the other folks have said, some of the smaller organizations seem like we don't get too much of a uh, uh, opportunity for some of the contracts. Um, but I was in a uh, meeting for the uh, 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 Small Business Administration, and they have a very, very cool program that kind of uh, matches a larger organization with a smaller organization. Um, and I kind of liked the way that they kind of uh, added kind of a mentor-mentee relationship in there. And that relationship starts at the beginning of the process and goes all the way throughout the uh, contracting process that they have in place for some of the uh, programs that they have. And I thought that was very unique. So I think that same thing could be applied here too, where there's a bit of a, uh, a, a big brother, a little brother program kind of going on with some of the organizations that may receive funding. Maybe there could be paired with other new organizations, smaller organizations, so that those organizations get a little bit of shepherding through the process uh, with organizations that have been there and done that before, but also kind of get to learn some of the uh, competencies from that larger organization, get a little bit of mentorship, but also get to kind of increase their own competencies too. Um, thanks for hearing me out. I think those would be great. Oh, one more thing. Uh, after the funding process is over, um, I my military time makes me want to do something that we used to call an after-action report. Um, it's kind of an autopsy of all of the things that happened, the logistics, the operation itself, the administration, uh, the actual action. Uh, um, um, and it kind of gives you an opportunity to do a little bit of what the other gentleman was uh, uh, mentioning. It allows you to things that are kind of uh, 
they use an acronym called SMART. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Megumi. Jean? Uh, yes. Um, what I would like to, um, to recommend on uh, reaching out and funding the smaller organizations, and what I mean by smaller organizations, these are organizations that are, are working on a shoestring. They've been working on a shoestring without any funding and major, major funding at all for years and years. So they don't have uh, a million dollar um, uh, funds that they can use operational funding. Neither do they have a three or a five year uh, uh, audit, independent audit by a CPA, but they've been in existence doing the work for, you know, for years upon years. So one of the things to, uh, as far as equity is concerned for these small, small organizations that have a history of, of let's say five to 10 years, some 15 years of providing services uh, on the ground. Um, one of the things that can ensure equity would be to uh, not put, not um, look for organizations in the community that can meet that, meet that threshold of an independent audit, nor having an operational budget of 500,000, 100,000, or a million dollars. But what they do have is they have a history. They do have, their organization is um, recognized as a 501c3, uh, and it's up to date. They also have their state through the Franchise Tax Board. They also have their Secretary of State um, registration as well. Um, so that's what I would recommend. That's how you can ensure that they have a legitimate organization because it's recognized by the IRS and also by the, uh, the uh, State Franchise Tax Board and also through the Secretary of State. Whether you want to have those documents, uh, they've been legalized for, let's say, for the last three years, that would be good. But um, eliminating that, that large threshold that none of the, hardly any of those grassroots small organizations can meet. Um, another thing too is if uh, showing a history um, because the organization haven't received any major funding nor contracts, you could possibly use uh, the history of the principal uh, that's running the organization. Um, through the work that they've been doing as part of their, uh, you know, job. Uh, and so I, I would think you can utilize that as one, but that would bring forth equity to me. Um, and so thank you. Thank you, Jean. Erica? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I spoke earlier and um, a lot of the things that I've been hearing resting is what, um, what Haven is doing and it done, has done in the past 12 years. I think we all can, the Emory Foundation can, you know, start a new coalition here with all this um, faith-based and nonprofit organizations that we offer all these programs and services and what may what Haven may offer, other organizations may not offer. One thing that we have been and we mentioned earlier is that we are lead agency in financial education. We don't just memorize a module, we don't chase the grant. We've been doing this for 12 years and we're sensitive, culturally sensitive, we're culturally to our previously incarcerated uh, men and women. So we understand, and I think this is a perfect example of an organization that has stuck to their mission, that we're not chasing the dollar, but we're doing this. We've been doing it for 12 years. We understand the community. We This is not the first time we teach financial literacy. We've been teaching for 12 years, English and Spanish. 
Um, we're sensitive to the community. We understand their credit and we have the capacity and cap capability to help this uh, clients get better credit scores, file their taxes, educate them in the process. So really align them to when we're talking economic mobility and, and generational wealth, we're here to, we believe in our community. We're, uh, or maybe grassroots because we've been doing this since the beginning. We are in the community. Um, recently, we, um, you know, at Watts, we started one day in Vida tax services, providing tax services for our community. We brought over two hundred thousand dollars in one day, filing taxes for low-income individuals and earn income tax credit that our community didn't know. Free tax preparation. So I think all of us here have a lot to to bring. Some of us are, are younger. Some of us are older. Some of us don't have the the um the budgets that we have we we um we have been actually be trying to do things um as expensive as they are to get audited financial statements with some nonprofits here it's they're very costly for the low budget that we have but we have to do it to be in alignment and to be in compliance and to show that we actually can do the work um it is very difficult it's not easy it's not easy as a uh, as a, uh, a graduate done profit organization to try to get to understand our direct services are very expensive, credit counseling, financial coaching, but guess what? We do it because we care about our community. We care about planting the seed. We believe in the individual and we believe that we can make a difference in our community, but it's a it takes a collective. We cannot do it alone. We don't have money for marketing. Our marketing materials is our organizations that we partner with and they refer clients to us that we come and do financial literacy we oftentimes were you utilized by bigger nonprofits that get the grant and they come and let us do the financial literacy because we they know that we do it do they pay us no we they don't pay us but you know unfortunately we don't do it they're just gonna say okay you don't have you, you you don't have to do it we just we do it because we care about our community but again it takes a collective it takes all of us to work together what can your organization offer that my organization doesn't offer so i think that we need to this is an exploration i think that we need to continue the conversation uh, we can't do it alone and if anybody of you need our services, please reach out to us. We will put our, our information in the link. If anybody needs to file their taxes, we'll do a year round. Um, let us know what we can do. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Larry? Larry? Okay, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, good, if, uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm the uh, Reverend Larry Foy. I'm a uh, uh, associate pastor at Lincoln Memorial Congregational Church, which is located uh, Martin Luther King and Arlington. And um, we have a wonderful organization, uh, 501c3, uh, called the Galen and Catherine Rivas Center. We've been in the community since 1995. Uh, the name change was recent, uh, but we do wonderful work with uh, young people uh, and uh, with families, uh, serving youth and strengthening their families. We have a 10,000 square foot facility uh, that we built uh, to serve young people and families. And I just wanted to say that I want to second everything that Ms. Franklin said about uh, small organizations that do not rise to that 500,000 plateau and above uh, that these are the organizations that are often overlooked and these are organizations that uh, do not have that kind of audit uh, that some uh, funders require. And I think that these organizations should not uh, be overlooked because these are really the organizations that are doing a lot of work that people are just not aware of and can do even greater work if they are funded. So I just wanted to second uh, uh, Ms. Franklin's uh, comments. And again, that organization is the Galen and Catherine Reavers Center. The ED may be on this call uh, and she may want to come in, but anyway, I just wanted to, uh, to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Danielle? Danielle?
he will move and we'll get back to you, uh, Danielle. I don't know if you're on. Oh, oh I'm here. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I think I mentioned it before, but just I think that there could be a separate process for maybe the larger nonprofits than there is for the smaller nonprofit organizations. Because the larger nonprofit organizations usually have one development person, but us smaller organizations, we're pretty much our entire organization. Um, or we might have one staff. So if we had a process that's just a little bit smaller that allows us to receive grants, and then also I would love to see a capacity building program that also includes a grant, a large enough grant that we could actually work with, like not 10000 or 5000 but $100,000 with a capacity building program um, that we may go to monthly would be really, really great. And that focuses on, like takes us through development phases, like maybe the financial phase, of how to budget out that $100,000. And then the next phase, how to develop your program. Then the next phase, your data and your resources. And like really take us through an entire program um, that is focused on the program that we all, that we already have with funding included with it. Thank you. Rebecca? Thanks. I'm reading some responses to question four from the chat from Noel Lopez, prioritize funding toward BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, Black Indigenous People of Color, led organizations in alignment to the services, to the service priority and targeted population. Um, Noel makes a note that we do not receive the same amount of funding compared to white led organizations and are often overlooked. Uh, and uh, Erica Torres, uh, put contact information for Haven Neighborhood Services in the chat, etories at havenservices.org. Uh, Noel also added for free financial capability and housing services in LA County, you can visit. And then the website for havenservices.org. Uh, all this available in the chat. Thank you, Rebecca. Pastor Michelle. Yes. So, so I want to say, because this is very important to me, very important. Um, first, I want to thank Danielle for adding and including on the capacity, because I'm always screaming capacity. I need help. I need help. I need help. Uh, I am the one of the, um, uh, our organization is with the ATI uh, first cohort. And so the information that we've been given and the sessions in the first cohort have been extremely helpful to repositioning uh, our organization. When you talk about grassroots uh, work, uh, I am one who has been in community. I provide gender specific services for females. I've been in the camps, the schools. I've worked the LA Bridges program. I've worked the Beyond the Bell. I've worked with every lead agency, Stop the Violence, Brotherhood Crusade, African-American uh, Community Center, I worked on the mental health, excuse me, not the mental health. I worked with Kedron. I've worked with uh, Shields for Families. I've worked with, um, you just about name it. And I've been there boots on the ground uh, to work uh, again at the capacity of helping to restore our community, to help again as a, as a, as a woman of faith, never looking at an individual, never judging, never um, just loving, helping and serving. And so what we, what we really need, we need these dollars. Our community is dying. And I know you guys know this. Um, our kids are dying. This pandemic that we just had was the worst thing that ever could have happened to us. Uh, I'm also a gang intervention specialist. So this, this, this pandemic just, just took us back. It just set us back almost 15 to 20 years. If some of you that do this work understand that. Our children are more prone to using um, substances that they do not know. They're not developed appropriately. So their brains cannot even take it or handle it. And so we're seeing more trauma in community than we ever have. So when you talk about what the need is, and I know you were talking about what that looked like from a paperwork standpoint, uh, and many of us do understand documentation, quantitative, qualitative measures, um, assessments, pre and post assessment, case, ma case management, working with a multidisciplinary team, wraparound services. So we, we get that. We know how to build a program out, but what we don't have is time 
to play games. We need help. We need funding. We need it down in our community right now to help these agencies that are out here on the ground doing the work. So I just want to make sure that um, uh, that you that, that you hear the cry, that you hear the cry of the unheard voice crying out in our community. We need help. We need it now. And we don't want to play any games about getting it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment or feedback on question number four about ensuring equity? Just gonna um, drop, uh, again, I'm going to drop information in the chat uh, for our electronic um, survey. All of these questions are available online. So if you were not able to participate today or you know someone who would like to answer these questions who was not here, um, this is, this is where they can answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Next slide, Carmen. So thank you everyone. That concludes our listening session for tonight. I wanna to thank everybody uh, for participating and joining um, and have a great night. And again, thank you so much for participating. Thank you very much for having us. You're welcome. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you, good night. Hey, everybody have a good night. Jane Bond signing Good night. <laughs> Eric, I see that Derek Spiva has a, has a raised hand. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. When, uh, I, they said you were going to tell us when the RFP or the applications were going to be available, and I didn't hear that. Did I miss that? No, we're not. Um, we will, when it does come out, we have your uh, email on our email list, and that will be emailed out to you. Okay, but you don't have any idea when? We don't yet. We're looking at June. June. Oh, okay. So it won't be for a while. Okay, that's all, that's what I needed to know. All right, thank you. No problem. I don't know. It looks like we still had uh, someone on uh, on the uh, chat raising a hand still. Reginald? Yes, I just wanted to ask, would it, everybody that's on the uh, email waiting list be sent uh, information about the RFPs? That is correct, Reginald. Um, we have compiled a, an in-depth list of participants and they will have information sent out as the RFPs roll out. Absolutely, thank you for that question. All right, thank you. We appreciate the form, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for participating and joining us today. That concludes our presentation. Have a good evening.